we play through any Pokemon game starting with Generation 2, helpful NPCs may inform us of how Pokemon can utilize held items themselves in battle. In Gen 2, our starter even comes equipped with a berry that restores its health once it dips below 50% to demonstrate this. However, most of us don't really heed this. Our conception of items tends to be more manual, the stuff that takes a turn to use, revives, hyper potions, full restores, and such. In the competitive world though, such items are not allowed, and only held items are present. Held items are an essential part of serious play, with knowledge and use of them pivotal to success. Their power is such that they shape a huge portion of the game, both directly in terms of their effects, such as leftovers as healing or choice bands power, or indirectly in terms of making the opponent try to figure out what item a Pokemon is holding. After all, dealing with a Dragon Dance or Calm Mind Sweeper is very different depending on if they're holding a Lumberry, Leftovers, a Resist Berry, or Life Orb. Of course, there are many other elements to the game of Pokemon, but the effect of items can be so drastic that they can, at times, feel like they are quite close to everything. And we're going to delve into the specifics today as we examine the intricacies and nuances of why items are close to everything, otherwise known as the Giratina Theorem. We're going to start off big with the Pokemon for whom items are actually everything. Those that have their forms changed by the item they hold, i.e. they literally do not exist without their held item. This first appeared in Generation 4 with the release of Platinum, which saw Giratina when equipped with the Grisius Orb, transform from the pure defensive wall it had been before into its far more offensively threatening Levitate Bearing Origin form, which proceeded to define and change much of the metagame around it. Later in the generation, Arceus Arceus's release took this concept to the extreme. Its default normal form could hold any item, but if equipped with one of the type boosting plates, flame plate, splash plate, and so on, it could change its type, also becoming an entirely different Pokemon. Dealing with Arceus fighting and Arceus ghost was very, very different. Arceus was also amazing at shifting between types because it always retained the same incredible stat spread, whereas Giratina Origin had its offenses and defenses swapped with its altered form. Not that anyone would complain Giratina O wasn't bulky enough, of course, but it was a trade-off. In a similar vein to Arceus, several generations later, Silvali would play similarly, shifting between types depending on the type of memory it held. However, the memory drives did not offer any boosts, only changing Silvali's type, as opposed to the Grisius Orb and Arceus's plates. The Grisius Orb gave Giratina a 20% boost to both its Dragon and Ghost stabs, while the plates, of course, gave a 20% boost to the stab of whichever type Arceus would become. The exception to this was the occasions in Generation 7 where Arceus would change type by holding a Z crystal instead of a plate, meaning it wouldn't have boosted stab. But this was a worthwhile trade off since it was, well, an Arceus that could use a Z move. Interestingly, the design of Silvali's signature move, the type shifting per Silvali's type multi attack, may have been changed to reflect this perpetual built in boost of Arceus's. As in Generation 7, multi attack was only 90 base power, but in Generation 8, it was buffed to 120. Multi-attack is of course patterned after the original signature type shifting move, Arceus' Judgment, which came in at 100 base power. But seeing as the move changed typing if Arceus held a plate, that meant it was effectively 120 with the built-in plate boost. In a similar vein to Arceus and its Z-Crystals, Gen 7 also was home to Ultra Necrozma, which was a particularly extreme case, as it didn't start the battle out in this form. If Necrozma Duskmane or Dawn Wings, almost always Duskmane in the competitive scene, held the special Z Crystal Ultra Necrozium Z, it could transform into Ultra Necrozma mid-battle, which is utterly insane, especially considering how radically different Ultra Necrozma was from Duskmane. At least it didn't receive passive boosts to its attacks, nah. It just had the most over-the-top Z move ever in both name and power. Light that burns the sky. Finally, in terms of form changing without any boost, we have literally every Mega Pokemon, besides Rayquaza, but that's a different story. Every Mega Pokemon and their respective Megastone, they don't start the game out in their form, but instead transform on a turn chosen by the user. Usually you just want to Mega Evolve as soon as possible to reap the full benefits of the Mega 
Mega Evolution, as they are almost always 100% upgrades over the original, but there are some rare cases where you want to hold off on Mega Evolving. For example, Mega Charizard X is weak to Earthquake, but if you need opportunities to Dragon Dance, maybe you hold off on the Mega in order to utilize base Charizard's Earthquake immunity. In a similar yet different vein, both Primals, Groudon, and Kyogre need to merely hold the red or blue orb respectively to transform into these world-crushing monstrosities as soon as they enter the battle. It's probably a good thing they, as well as the Megas, don't have any more boosts built into their items, as they're already unbelievably overpowered. Particularly noticeable about the Primals, as well as each of the other forms listed, is that while the items they must hold are a perfectly reasonable price for such excellent Pokemon, being unable to hold other items does at times restrict them. Most notably, one of the few things keeping the Primals in check is their inability to passively heal with leftovers. If you need an example of a Primal or Mega technically, but effectively the same thing, if you need an example of such a Pokemon going utterly bonkers because it's also allowed to hold an item on top of everything else, well, Mega Rayquaza had that and got banned from Ubers and created the Anything Goes tier literally a week afterwards. Now, it's hard to match the impact of items that literally transform Pokemon, but Leftover certainly comes close. It's existed as long as held items themselves, first appearing in Generation 2, and is in many ways the quintessential competitive item. What Pokemon wouldn't like to passively receive a little bit of health back each turn? It's the kind of incredibly useful effect that perfectly epitomizes the essence of held items. In a game all about trying to take as little damage as possible, being able to offset even a small part of it without having to take a turn to heal manually is incredible. In fact, Leftover's recovery is so good that certain walls without recovery moves rely on it as their only source of healing, accentuating it with Protect. It's been a staple on Heatran ever since it was introduced. Of course, while Leftover seems like an item purely for defensive Pokemon, the passive recovery can also be vital for offensive Pokemon as well. The method for playing around certain hard-hitting offensive threats usually is to wear them down, to let them succumb to the timer of passive damage, but one that is limited than counterplay because becomes far more difficult. See for example Gen 3 Heracross, where it doesn't even heal with lefties thanks to the omnipresent Sandstorm. However, simply not losing health to sand each turn makes it far more difficult to deal with, since you can no longer deal with it by clicking protect and waiting for it to go down. There are some leftover styles alternatives of course. Black Sludge will heal poison types just as leftovers would, but hurt non-poison types holding it for equal damage. What's the point? Well, if you switch your poison type into a Pokemon using Trick, you are able to punish the opponent for using a move that would also punish you. For example, in Generation 4, when Rotom Wash tricks a Choice Scarf onto a Blissey or Clefable, it is delighted not just for having ruined them, but also for receiving leftovers in the process. However, if a Trix and a Black Sludge bearing Roserade comes in, suddenly Rotom is losing health. The other alternative is also Poison-centric, coming in the form of Pokemon who hold a Toxic Orb to inflict themselves with Poison to activate their Poison Heal ability, gaining effectively double leftovers recovery, while also not fearing status. Gliscor and Breloom have famously used this ability to incredible effect. Gliscor's reputation as near immortal is well centered over multiple generations, while Breloom stands out as a vicious attacker that manages to heal in Sandstorm despite not being immune to it, an incredibly rare trait, while also being a physical attacker that doesn't fear burn. We mentioned Rotom Wash and its Choice Scarf, and that leads us into the three choice items, among the most defining options in the game, which also perfectly encompass the risk-reward nature of competitive play. In order to receive an immediate plus one boost to attack, special attack, or speed, depending on which of choice band specs or scarf you choose, respectively, you will be locked into the first move you choose each time you switch in. You can lead off with a super-powered specs Draco Meteor from Latios or close combat from Urshifu, but you won't be able to select a a different move until you switch out and come back in. But then again, with the power and opportunity that these items offer, you often won't need to. That's the push and pull, the pro and con dynamic of choice items. With immediate added power or speed, you don't require that all important setup turn. And if you would like a refresher on how important each of every turn is, feel free to consult our video on it, the Salamence Theorem. At least if you're facing something like Source Dance Terrakion, you have one turn to potentially try and maneuver around it before it has that plus two boost. But when it's a 
expanded variant, you have to be able to take its boosted hits immediately. In the introduction, we mentioned not knowing the opponent's item being incredibly difficult. And choice items are a superb example. Does the opposing Tapu Lele have the immediate power of choice specs, or does it outspeed my Pokemon because it has choice Scarf? Or is it even choice at all? And am I giving it a free calm mind by switching? This is not to say choice items don't have cons, of course. Being locked into a move, no matter how powerful, is going to be exploitable in one way or another. Now, opposing Pokemon are going to get free turns no matter what, but later in the game, when everything's damaged, it can become more of a risk to lock into Dark Pulse with Ash Greninja and give the opposing Magearna a shift gear. Then again, choice items can also help against boosting threats. Choice Scarfers are usually a go-to response to the likes of Dragon Dancers that boost their speed, for example. That's not the only way choice items can be exploited either. Over-relying on them means that the opponent can scout your move with Protect and switch to a Resist accordingly, rather than having to play a more dangerous prediction game. Incidentally, this is one reason Urshifu was so dangerous. Its Unseen Fist ability breaks Protect, so forget scouting it. You're always in that dangerous prediction game against it. There are also many other boosting items out there and have been ever since Gen 2. Magnet boosted electric type moves, charcoal boosted fire type moves, and so on. In Generation 2 and 3, these items were rare, though with some legitimate use such as Magnet Magneton maxing out its odds to KO especially defensive Skarmory in Gen 3 or Charcoal Moltres potentially to it KOing Snorlax after a sunny day with some chip damage in Gen 2. However, they were rare overall, owing to the fact that they only gave a 10% boost. In Generation 4, they were buffed to boost by 20%, the same as the place that had been introduced and saw more use, with Offensive Magnet Zapdos a particularly fierce example. Generation 4 also introduced Expert Belt, which boosted super effective hits by 20%. At first, this was wielded by the seemingly king of super effective coverage, Electivire, but as it fell to the wayside for ineffectiveness, the item in instead became seen on vicious mixed attackers like Jirachi and Tyranitar, which were among the best lures in the game. Assuming Jirachi was locked into Iron Head would get many a Swampert Grass Knotted, or assuming Tyranitar was locked into Pursuit would get many a Scizor Fire Blasted. Gen 4 really was intent on providing seemingly every type of boost imaginable, as it also introduced Wise Glasses and Muscle Band, which provided a boost to all special or physical attacks respectively, though this is balanced by the boost only being 10%. Thus, though many special attackers can and sometimes do find use for it, it's usually an exception. Gen 4 was also the origin for Flame and Toxic Orb, which are boosting if they're activating Guts, or Toxic Boost in the latter's case, lending Pokemon like Heracross, Conkelder, and Ursa Luna a brutal level of threat, assisted by a hyper-powerful facade. The biggest non-choice Gen 4 boosting item, though, was Life Orb. Yes, the 10% recoil can be pretty nasty, but the 30% power boost is impressive, especially because the Pokemon used the item want that level of strength while being able to do what these other aforementioned items allow them to as well switch between moves sure the 50 percent boost from choice items is massive but it doesn't mean much if you're going to be thudding into resists or worse immunities when you've got a skarmory switching into a bandit or scarf flygon's earthquake that's deadly when you've got a skarmory switching into a mixed life or flygon's earthquake it still has to run in terror lest it get roasted by the subsequent fire blast life orb enables the immediacy of mixed attackers who want to hit as hard as possible on both sides of the spectrum, especially helping compensate for an inability to invest in both attacking stats as much as one would like. See Infernape as an example, and while Life Orb's recoil can often be turned against its user with good switching, taking advantage of the opponent's self-imposed timer, limiting how much damage can be wrought before going down, the extra power can be overwhelming at times too. Life Orb also makes certain setup sweepers downright ridiculous. Tacking on a Life Orb boost in addition to Vulcan Corona's Quiver Dance or Terrakion's Swords Dance can be utterly obscene. Life Orb is at its best when its recoil is ignored, which is rare, but the results are stunning. Magic Guard Reuniclus and sometimes even Clefable are able to reap the full benefits of its power without caring for the recoil, as are Sheer Force Pokemon using Sheer Force boosted attacks. The inability to get worn down for spamming its ludicrously strong Earth Power, as well as Focus Blast, Psychic, Sludge Wave, and Rock Slide, was a major factor in Landorus and Carnage's brokenness.
Often though, making an optimal elite offensive threat isn't just about ringing in as much power as you can out of a Pokemon. It's about defending yourself against common counterplay, and that's why the status healing Lumberry is such a fixture. Such a definitive part of so many of the scariest sweepers around. If you can stop a setup sweeper by going for the burn or paralysis or poison or even sleep as it boosts, then you're going to find it fairly easy to deal with. But when there's so much status flying around and the setup sweeper can take advantage of this for a free boost, they get so many more opportunities and become so much scarier as a result. This is famously exemplified by Dragon Dance Dragonite, whose Lumberry serves a dual purpose. It can either grab it a setup turn against something using status like Breloom, Heatran, or Rotom, or it can use it to snap out of confusion after unleashing Outrage, allowing it to continue its onslaught of terror. Even if such a Pokemon isn't able to sweep, or even if Lum is used on non-sweeping attackers like Mix Jirachi or Lee Machamp, simply having the option of shrugging off status allows such Pokemon flexibility in battle, gaining defensive purpose and disrupting opponents' momentum, or even just being able to force their way through a one-on-one -on -one more effectively, like when faced with the otherwise difficult task of taking on Paralysis spreading Jirachi or Breloom Spore. It removes a lot of counterplay and makes the attacker a lot more dangerous. You won't want to waste the turn Will-O-Wisping a Machamp or Tyranitar with Rotom if they have a Lumberry. Speaking of berries, if offensive Pokemon of all sorts, especially setup sweepers, aren't using Lum, they're very likely going to use Resist berries, having the damage from a specific type of super effective attack. This is one of the most devastating examples of nullifying counterplay. Sure, that Gyarados got itself a Dragon Dance, but you've got a Thunderbolt Starmie, and the Gyarados is holding a Wakan Berry. It lives the Thunderbolt and proceeds to steamroll you. Got an Ice Beam for Garchomp? Garchomp's got a Yacht Berry for your Ice Beam. It's not just useful to make offensive Pokemon tougher to answer either. It's excellent as a defensive tool for bolstering offensive Pokemon's ability to take hits in a pinch, getting more defensive utility out of them without sacrificing their offensive capabilities, sometimes even increasing it by doing so in fact, or needing to use an all-out wall on a team that can't fit it. You think your agility in Polion is going to sweep because there's a bunch of offensive pokes and no Blissey on the other team? Guess again, because the opposing Tyranitar has a Pasho Berry and withstands Hydro Pump with ease. Then again, its superpower might also bounce off a Chopple Berry variant of Empoleon, so this kind of thing can go both ways. Resist Berries, whether used offensively or defensively, are potentially among the greatest weapons one can find, especially because they aren't revealed until they're used. See Payapa Berry Toxapex withstanding Psychic from Mega Alakazam and Mega Latios in order to land a crucial Toxic on them. And because certain Pokemon can viably run several different type of Resist Berries, such as Gen 4 Heatran viably being able to run all of Pasho, Chopple, and the Earthquake weakening Shukaberry, which results in you often not knowing which way to try to take it out if you're not lucky enough to even have that luxury. Speaking of counterplay to common tactics, we now come to a controversial item, the hazard ignoring heavy duty boots. At first theorized to be a haven for Pokemon who would otherwise be heavily hindered by the similarly controversial Stealth Rock, and boy did it ever wind up doing that, most famously resulting in Cinderace getting banned from Gen 8 twice. Boots wound up being fixtures on more than just Rock's weak Pokemon. When unencumbered by constant pressure from hazards, even Rock's neutral Pokemon like Tapu Koko were elevated to enormous levels of longevity, allowing them to batter away at the opponent over and over. And speaking of longevity, there was nary a more complained about combination than that of Boots and Regenerator, which resulted in Pokemon like Slowking becoming seemingly unkillable since they switched in with such riskless ease. The controversy arose from how difficult it was to punish such terrible terrifying Pokemon from switching in, especially the likes of Volcarona. Boots' effect was so powerful and widespread, they effectively displaced Leftovers as a de facto item on defensive Pokemon. Being able to withstand hazard pressure, players argued, contributed more to longevity and being able to take big hits than passive recovery, which would mostly just be trying and failing to minimize the damage taken from hazards. Boots were a perfect choice for any kind of Pokemon, offensive or defensive, because you knew they'd always be useful, not just for rocks, mind you, but for spikes as well. Here's how insane Boots' effect on the game was. So many teams were running Boots on so many Pokemon that it suddenly became reasonable to not run Stealth Rock on your team at all. This is utterly ludicrous considering how essential the move was from Gens 4 through 7. Finally, we have an ode to insane boosting items which did not last, Z-Crystals and Gems. 
Z Crystals weren't inherently offensive boosters, as they could be used on a decent variety of non-attacking moves. As Z Heal Bell healed its user's HP in addition to its usual effect, Z Celebrate boosted all stats by one, and there was even a tournament battle where Rocky MZ Lander Asterion used Z Stealth Rock to boost its defense and win the game. But by and large, Z moves were used to take offensive moves and turn them into outrageous explosions of power. In addition to their enormous strength, Z moves also removed any chance to miss, and even even dealt 25% of their would-be damage output if mistimed and hitting into a protect. The examples were endless, from Infernal Overdrive Heat Ran, to Breakneck Blitz Kartana, to All Out Pummeling Tapabulu, to Twinkle Tackle Magirna, to Hydro Vortex Manaphy, to Devastating Drake Garchomp, brutally powerful Zemus ruled over Gen 7 OU, both through sheer strength and through not knowing which Pokemon would even have the Z-Crystal, or even which Z-Crystal it would use. Teams regularly stacked multiple viable Z users, and even if you narrowed it down to say Heatran, you still didn't know if it'd be Fireum or Gracium or Steelium, each of which could really ruin your switching if you got it wrong. Z moves didn't last past Gen 7 and were similar in this vein to gems, which, barring normal gem, were removed from the game after Gen 5. Gems were particularly brutal because they were just about identical in effect to Z moves, but while Z moves were limited to one per team, there was no limit to how many gems you could stack. Plus, to really rub salt in the wound, using Protect on a gem boosted attack would not waste the gem. Hyper offense teams were generally unwallable when stacking the likes of Bug Gem Volcarona, Dragon Gem Dragonite, Fighting or Grass Gem Breloop, or Ice Gem Cloister. The latter two were particularly brutal because gems powered up every hit or their multi-hit moves, like Bullet Seed and Icicle Spear respectively. Funnily enough, gems were not fully appreciated in their time. Sure, you had major threats like Flying Gem Acrobatics Glyscore and Grass Gem HP Grass Heat Rat, but gems themselves weren't dominating the meta. However, after the power of Z moves was fully revealed, players looked at gems with a new eye and began spamming the daylights out of them, upending the metagame into complete chaos as teams couldn't handle the barrage of overwhelming power being thrown at them, resulting in gems doing what Z moves couldn't and getting banned. Before we go, we have to mention a couple miscellaneous items which have had enormous impacts on the game as well. When Focus Sass was released in Generation 4, everyone freaked out at the prospect of a Pokemon being able to live any hit at full health. In fact, it's what prompted Stealth Rock to start being used as much as it was. And funnily enough, Focus Sash became the standard option on lead Pokemon to ensure they set up Stealth Rock. Beyond that, Sash was the go-to item on Alakazam in Gen 5, whose Magic Guard ability ensured that it never lose the Sash to field conditions set up before it even had a chance to switch in, like hazards or weather. Rocky Helmet arrived in Generation 5 and became a crucial item in helping players combat physically offensive onslaughts as it allowed them to deal out damage while playing defensively. It was an excellent punish for the otherwise spammable U-turn, as well as helping give pushback against the many outrages and close combats littering the tier. Beyond dealing with offensive moves like these, it also helped punish use of Rapid Spin and thus became a crucial part of the Hazard War. Rocky Helmet was especially effective on Pokemon with contact move punishing abilities, most famously Garchomp's Rough Skin and Ferrothorn's Iron Barbs. In a similar vein, Gen 6's Assault Vest has also been crucial for helping withstand enormously powerful special attacks. The cost of only being able to use attacking moves is quite reasonable, especially since in a Resist Berry-esque way, it encourages the use of more offensive Pokemon that can take hits, as opposed to going the all-out wall approach. Tornado Steering became Gen 6's most defining Assault Vest user thanks to Regenerator, providing it passive recovery, while Tangrowth used used the item to similar excellent effect in Gen 7 as well, while being even better on the recovery front thanks to the bits of healing it got from its stab Giga Drain. Air Balloon providing a temporary earthquake and spikes immunity is specific, but incredible for Pokemon like Heatran and Terrakion, making dealing with them early on much tougher since the ground types that normally do well don't get the job done. And as Pokemon like Starmie and Volcarona in Generation 5 have demonstrated, you don't have to be ground weak to get the most out of Balloon either. Simply being able to switch into an earthquake is enormous for gaining opportunities. Shed Shell arrived in Generation 4 to help against trapping and brought Scarbury more respite against its dreaded rival Magnezone. Sure, it didn't care for the loss of leftovers, but the upside was potentially enormous. Shed Shell also saw use on various Pokemon attempting to escape Dugshiro before Arena Traps ban across multiple generations. And even Toxapex sometimes used the item in Gen 7 to help it pivot around Heatran's otherwise deadly Magma Storm. Cut Berry is a rarer item, but the ability to move first to turn 
burn after you hit 25% or lower HP is potentially enormous, and not just on lead Pokemon either. Several offensive threats, such as Gen 4 Machamp and Gen 6 Manaphy, became so much scarier when they can grab another KO after being hit down to low health, as they so often are rather than just being revenge killed by anything faster. Finally, weakness policy is an unusual item, but boy does it punish hitting something super effectively, with a plus 2 attack and special attack it provides upon doing so. The likes of multi-skill Dragonite and stored power Magirna are testament to this. And that's it! Of course, there are many, many other useful competitive items out there. Plus, we could have dedicated the entire video to just one of the items we went over here. There's just too many to talk about. So we want to know, what are some underrated competitive items and applications for them? What about underrated applications for the items we've gone over in this video? One thing's for sure though, and that's that items are critical. It's why knockoff is such a hugely important move after all, but that's also a topic for another video. In conclusion, mastering the use of items is critical critical to mastering competitive Pokemon itself. After all, without certain orbs, plates, or memories, you won't even unlock certain Pokemon. Thanks for watching, everyone. And as always, if you like the video and you want to see more, be sure to subscribe to False Swipe Gaming for more weekly Pokemon content. And thank you so much to our patrons for continued support of our videos. And thank you to everyone else watching as well. And follow my crew on these social media platforms. And that's all I got. See you next time, everyone.